So how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm still fairly jet-lagged. I seem to have a major case of jet-lag this trip across. Okay. And uh, are you still in uh, Connecticut, or are you back in the United Kingdom? Or? Oh, no, no. I'm still in Connecticut. I'll be here through the Christmas holidays. Okay. Um, are, are you going to be performing poetry in other places? or? I am. I have performances next week at the University of Connecticut and at Southern. Okay. That's pretty good. So um, I don't know if we've uh, established this when I interviewed you for the newscast, but um, how did you get started write, writing poetry? Do you know, I got my first rejection letter when I was five, so I really don't remember when really? I started. <laughs> okay, so we're going way back then. Um, way back. I used to write more stories than I did poems, and then when I was in university, that kind of flip-flopped. Okay, okay. So um, from a very young age, you, you pretty much knew that this is what you wanted to do. And... I always love to do things with words, whether it's reading or writing. Mm -hmm. I have more books than is strictly healthy. And, like, do you remember uh, the first opinions that people gave you of your poetry? Any criticisms or any compliments? Um, well, my mom has always been my biggest fan, but, of course, she's biased. I can remember Edward Wheeler in high school. I went to the Williams School, and I, I wrote a poem about an ice storm, and he said it was too delicate. So, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> that, I mean, no, that, I, I, that's uh, kind of uh, ironic to here because the ice storms are usually a very rough thing to go through. I mean, especially if you have the ice uh, painting on your face and everything. I mean, that's just... Uh, yes, uh, it, was, it was the blizzard of 78 that I was writing about, and oh. it was that the states had been brought to a standstill. Yeah. And I was trying to convey the fact that it was beautiful and deadly at the same time. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a nice mix. I can see that happening. Um, do, uh, do you worry of getting too over-sentimental or melodramatic with your poetry? Because, you know, a lot of uh, stereotyped, um, I would say, assumptions about poetry is, is that, oh, it talks about, you know, trees and love and happiness. I mean, do you ever worry about getting to that point? Um, I'm not entirely sure that I would, especially since I sort of specialize in the dramatic monologue which, as the name implies, is inherently dramatic. It's, it could be, it's meant to be performed as well as read, okay. with character assumed. So I don't think it's over-dramatic, but I'm certainly very dramatic. Okay. So you, you, you describe your style as purely a dramatic monologue, uh, borrowing from the theater, um, but with, you know, kind of a take of a poet, at, you know, as if, you know, someone is just... Uh, reciting their words on stage. So you mix those two things yeah, together? I, I definitely mix genres. Okay. I always, even when I was in university, I was very interdisciplinary. I took literature, I took history, um, folk tale, I just mixed them all together. Okay. Um, I do that in my as well. I do write the more personal stuff. Well. Okay. Uh, what I'm really well known for and what's got me to the names of the film is Okay. Um, is uh, my dramatic on I have to ask you a question. I'm sorry to go off topic here. Are, are you uh, cooking tea? Because I hear like a loud like tea noise in the background, like you're, uh, you know, cooking from a kettle. No, I can hear that. I can hear that sort of whining as well. I don't know what it is. I've, okay. Quiet in here. Uh, that's weird. Okay. Well, um, that's fine. We'll, we'll try to uh, distract. Well, we'll distract. We'll try to distract ourselves from the uh, the essence of making tea. So. Yeah. That's, that's fine. Uh, maybe it's just because I'm British, or possibly, uh, or possibly the computer. Yeah, it could be. Um, wh uh, who are some of your influences? I mean, do you have any particular professional poets that just made you say, okay, I really want to get into this? Yes. There were two poets when I was an undergraduate who changed my world, and one of them was H.D., she's a modernist, and her poem Eurydice really changed the way I looked at mythology. And another one, Margaret Atwood, who has a 20-odd page sequence of um, Circe mud poems, it's called, which tells the Odyssey from the point of view of Circe. Okay. That was very formative. Mm -hmm. And also, these days, of the poet laureate, Carol Ann Duffy. Mm. Okay. So the, uh, a, a lot of uh, influences. Um, do they... Do they all have the same particular style, or are they all varied in their own way as far as how they present their uh, poetry? They all have distinctive voices. What they all have in common is that they tend to do, as I do, a variety of both the personal and the revisionist and revisionist mythology. 
Okay. And has uh, poetry made you see life in ways that most others may not see it? I mean, are, are you opening your eyes to new things? And uh... I say because I can't see what other people are seeing by definition. Okay. But um, I do certainly, for example, one time I was having coffee with a friend and he was telling me how he'd injured himself by falling downstairs whilst concentrating on a poem rather than the stairs. And the phrase he used because he had difficulty getting into the car because his legs seized up, was somewhere between the front door and the car, I turned into a wardrobe. What? And, you know, that was <laughs> the first slides of a poem. How could I not steal that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely worthy of putting down. I mean, that's just, I mean, who would come up with that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but, hey, I mean, congratulations to your friend. Maybe he should uh, uh, get He's a... a very accomplished poet. Oh, well, really? Oh, what, what's his name? Uh, Paul Sermon. I don't think he's been published on this side of the Atlantic, but he's very well published in the UK. Oh, well, he should give me a call sometime. Uh, what is your uh, view on a career in poetry? Um, you know, do you think it should be something that is university taught or something that you naturally start yourself? Because um, I, I imagine a, a lot of people, you know, would think, wait, how, how do you like make money off of this? How do you gain a fortune out of, out of the, uh, well, not to gain a fortune, but just gain a simple living? off of this um so like how, how is that working out for you it's very very difficult to make a living out of poetry i know very few people who do it most of the poets i do also i know also have a day job um i know one poet in the uk julie bowden she is the poet laureate um of, of i think birmingham but if not she's definitely the brighton residence at the national symphony hall and she manages to do it. But the next one I know, um, Mark, he has a day job. He works nine to five. And on top of that, he does 98 to 100 gigs a year. And and uh, this is performing in like open mic clubs? Uh... Open mic clubs, various slams. Uh, he has dedicated things. He runs workshops, all that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and I'd imagine that if you were... Uh, university taught, you know, in the sense of you took many uh, poetry and writing classes in school that maybe a, a good boost would be to have professors say, okay, you know, please have this person perform, this person's worth it. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is that how you got your foot in the door? Like, how did you uh, uh, become what you are today? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's a dangerous question. <laughs> I, I got into performance in a serious way about two years ago when my supervisor at the job I was then at invited me to one of his readings. He was also a poet. And then I joined the group that was sponsoring that particular reading and it all sort of snowballed from there. Okay. Um, and are there any like unofficial or official limits as to what you can say in poetry? Uh, what, like for instance, um, can someone write a poem mocking the art and stereotypical form of poetry? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, really? Uh, write, writing poems about poetry is quite common. Okay. Uh, they, they don't tend to be published as much because it has been done quite a bit. Mm. But, um, yes, you, you write poems about poetry. You can write self-referential poetry. Um, you know, anything is fair, fair go, anything, as long as it's original and not stilted. Okay. Because I, I remember uh, attempting to write poetry in this uh, sort of competition that I had in an old college that I used to go to and the prize was $100 and I just started making stuff up about like tomatoes and showers and rhyming together and I thought and in my twisted sense of thinking I was like you know wait a minute if I you know do not make sense if I just mention like all these random things that's probably the best poetry because that's kind of that, that was my uh, very narrow stereotypical thinking about it is that okay if you just mention like you know random things out of nowhere like oh you know the trees remind me of cups in my syrup when I'm you know eating waffles or whatever I mean I thought that was just perceived as like the deepest thing ever and you could just make people cry in waterfalls off of that um but obviously that's not the way it is because i did not win the 100 dollars. so there is a certain market for the avant-garde and often that's that is uh, not taken as seriously as some of the rest of the poetry yeah yeah i mean it, it wasn't I wouldn't say I wasn't taking it uh, so much seriously. I just, I was having a lot of fun with it. I was just playing around with it, experimenting with words. And I mean, much like you, I like wordplay and, um, you know, experimenting with language. So, um, yeah. But 
Um, I, I noticed, and, and, and forgive me if this sounds like, oh, you know, country offending or something like that, but I was kind of like thrown back that you um, had an accent because I don't imagine like too, you know, too many people when I first meet them online that uh, they would have an accent. So you, you are from the UK, right? I, I, was, I was born in the US, but I've actually spent more time in the UK than I have in the US. Okay. Um, and how is the UK... Uh, different from the U.S. or in, I mean, in, but well, in similar ventures, either similar or different. Like, how are they as far as uh, the field of poetry? Well, of course, the market's a lot smaller, and you have a lot fewer magazines at the same time. Um, but there's no, there's no real sense that it's any less competitive. It's just that there are fewer intermediary stages. You know, a, a lot of the poetry magazines are perceived to have tiers of publication. If you get in the New Yorker here, for example, you've made it. Where it's, whereas if you get in the Times Literary Supplement, that would be analogous. Mm. But the mid-tier and the lower tier, there's just so, so many of, um, of little, little journals who may be really good, but do not have the reputation of the bigger ones. There are much more over here than there are in the UK. Mm. Okay. And um, do you have a specific... Oh, well, what's that? You have to do a lot of research. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, what kind of research, may I ask? Yes, there is a, a certain website, which I'm not sure if I should name, because I'm not sure how you are about product placement, but there are websites that let you track and tell you about different magazines and journals and what their acceptance rate is, and they have interviews with the editors and really useful things like that. Okay. Uh, and um, I want to ask you something. When, uh, well, actually, I'm asking you plenty of things. So what am I even saying? <laughs> um, do you have a specific target audience for your poetry? Because um, I, I notice upon you coming to college uh, that maybe you know college students uh, they're a great uh, people to reach because you know they're in that uh, stage where they like to you know try to express themselves, trying to experiment around with different sorts of uh, personalities and. Um, well, not like, you know, trying to be a schizophrenic or anything like that, but just, you know, trying out like different things, trying, trying to uh, figure out a, an identity through like various things. Like, for instance, you know, you want to play soccer or you, you want to shave for a living or you just all these like different things. So, it, I mean, and, and I feel like poetry is very similar in that venture of uh, just using all these different words and different languages and just uh, really playing around with the form. Um, so do you think that a college audience, uh, I mean, connects with that more? I mean, I, get... Different audiences connect in different ways with poetry, and certainly I write different poems with different types of audiences in mind. But to be absolutely honest with you, John, if any given poem that I write, if just one person says, you know, I, I understand that poem, that poem really said something to me. Even if it's just one poem, if it never gets published, I consider myself to have succeeded. Okay, okay. Uh, and so, um, so, uh, so I, I, when you write poetry, you never have like a specific target audience in mind. You uh, just write the way you want to write and uh, just, I mean, I, I, like, I, I'm just trying to figure out like how you go about and like, you know, seeing who... Uh, would accept your poetry more and see who wouldn't like what uh, besides colleges I mean uh, what other types of places have you performed and what you know types of people have you performed for I performed in cafes um, where which has a very mixed clientele I've performed in front of I'm not sure how to put it older people um, who are very much into the arts and supporting okay. the arts I don't know if you can hear the capital A on that. Like retirement homes or? Not retirement homes, okay. but in, in, in Oxford there is a, a gallery called Art Jericho. Mm. And there are a lot of poetry readings there. I've also read in bookstores. So, you know, that's a different audience again. Okay, okay. So, I mean, you, uh, it's, it's always a mix. It's always a... Always a mix. And you try to get your best guess and you try to tailor it to what might interest them. Okay. But it's always just a best guess, and you have to sort of tailor things at the time. Okay, that's pretty good. And um, uh, we mentioned before a, a, a short poem that you'd like to share with us to just kind of sample your work to the audience. Yes, very much so. I'd like to read one called Pharaoh's Concubine, 
and it's sort of my signature poem ever since I read it at a Poems in the Pub thing at Oxford, and it won the People's Choice Award. Okay. So here it is, Pharaoh's Concubine. Of course he was divine. He said so. There are many types of sacrifice. I was 13, just, pretty, straight nose, long neck, a way of speaking, so they said. Just shy, really. All the gold, the pomp, the myrrh-laced ceremonies, solemn and smoky intonations, all the choreographed apparitions, cowed me, as I suppose it was meant. When at last he came to see me, I was shocked to see two arms, two legs, and not a falcon's head or even a jackal's, but slightly uneven teeth, dark, soft eyes, and a pimple expertly disguised. I smiled. The years passed in rich, encoded rituals. We both aged. Both, it turned out, kept our figures. When at last his car left him, I wept and was passed on. And now, listening to the litanies of the new temple praising his ineffable divinity, I sing the words and do all that I ought. But sometimes, when I watch Ra's solo bark passing, I can't help wondering if, when they weigh my soul, he'll be clear-skinned and waiting, and if he still snores. That's it. <laughs> that's that's really nice. Um, I, it's 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 great because you don't sound like what I what I you know kind of think in my head as a poet. You know, like you don't have the the the, uh, the stereotypical like lines and rhymes and you know you don't have like that Dr. Seuss type of style. Do you know who Dr. Seuss is, by the way? Oh oh goodness, yes. I learned to read <laughs> with Sam. I am. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, it, it just flows well. It flows like a natural story. It's not even a poem. It's just it's 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 a, a very engaging narrative. So, um, I mean, I, I think you're doing well for yourself, and you're performing at, at UConn next, right? UConn on Tuesday, Southern on Wednesday. Okay, and um, Southern on Wednesday. Oh, that's actually where my sister goes to school. So maybe she'll run into you. Oh. Lovely, yes. Yes, and um, after that, uh, where where else are you going beyond Connecticut? I will be going at Bank Square Books in Mystic from two to four on the sixteenth, which is a Friday. Okay. And then a Lagrua Art Center in Stonington that evening. Okay, that's pretty good. And uh, how can people keep in touch with you uh, as far as uh, bookings and such? I have a website which is www.jenniferamgowan.com. And my bookings are usually up there, and there's a contact form as well. Okay, great, great, great stuff. Uh, well, it was a pleasure to have you on. Um, I uh, <laughs> mentioned uh, you, uh, you to this, oh, not you to this, uh, I mentioned this to you uh, through email uh, in advance. Um, I have a segment that I do with all my interviewees in the end called Odd Favorites. Um, it's a twist on the you know general, uh, much often tried uh, favorites. Uh, such as, oh, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite cup? Like all that stuff. Um, I like to twist it up um, in an odd sense. You know, favorites that you would not normally be asked just to you know, maybe keep things interesting and, um, I don't know, maybe keep things weird because I guess people like it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so just a couple of odd favorites. What is your favorite month to get moody? Probably November. November. Because there's... As the light closes in and it gets darker and darker, my mood just gets darker with it. Ah. After the solstice, I can persuade myself it's getting lighter. So, you know, my heart is progressively lighter and I'm che more cheerful. Ah, okay. All right, that's nice. Uh, so I guess your mood in November can go out on a date sometime because you guys <laughs> have so much in common. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yes, and uh, it actually kind of disappoints me that you say November because it's like, oh, that's my birthday month. So, uh, but uh, well, that's fine. That's fine, though. I mean, everybody has their moody months. Um, how about your favorite time of day to go off on a tangent in a conversation? I do not limit that to any time of day. Oh, but if you had to choose, what, what would be the best time of day? It just it, like hypothetically. It's fine when I'm nattering randomly to my friends in the evening. In the evening, okay. In the evening. Mm. Okay. Do you do that often or rare? Oh, yes. 
Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you're a poet, so I mean, yeah, of course, you having a lot of stories to tell. Just, I mean, it's it's uh, it's like brushing your teeth to you. It's just that natural. So. Well. <laughs> Complimentary of you to say. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you on that. <laughs> yeah, um, and how about your favorite breakfast item that you never think is quite right, that you're never satisfied with? I never get toast quite right. <laughs> okay, like um, just is it is it a bit too it's brown? Like it's either slightly too overdone and slight and carbonized, or it's not quite crisp enough. Okay, so uh, it, it, is the color okay, or is the color also a problem? I'm, I'm more concerned with texture. Mm. Okay, that's a good way to look at it. Um, let's see. And your favorite two words to never use in your poetry. Two words that you just, you know, you're disgusted by and you think are probably the most disgusting words in the English language. I'm not sure about disgusting, disgusting but I would never use the phrase, my bad. Ah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, what all the cool kids in America have attempted to uh, overplay um, back in the day. It's it's still it still you know comes on once in a while today, but uh, my bad. Yeah, that's that's very slangy, very unprofessional. Uh, so I I, w I would agree. Um, have you used that in regular conversation, or have you observed a lot of people using that? I like to think I intend it ironically. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, Maybe maybe my good will uh, be <laughs> a popular phrase soon. But, uh, as going back to what you said before, I as far as language is concerned, I use all levels of language, including various obscenities. Mm. Well, uh, I don't I don't you know strictly use obscenities, but I do use all levels of language. Okay, all right. Um, and I, I, this is a question that just popped out of my head. I don't know how this got to my head, um, but. Uh, going back to the limits, what you can and can't talk about in your poetry, because um, I'd imagine that some people may get uptight about uh, sexual imagery in poetry. And, I, and, and ironically, I am in an English class where we are in a poetry unit right now, and we're reading all these poems, and we're going to like do a final on it soon. And there was one particular poem uh, where, you know, it, 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 it was kind of uncomfortable for the class because it, it was very, very descriptive. I mean, not, it, it did not like use lit, literal words like, oh, sex and, uh, and screw and stuff like that. But, um, it found, it still found a way to use, uh, sexual uh, language and sexual topics per se in a poetic like way. So have you ever done that? Have you ever talked about, uh, you know, sexual things in your poem or just sexual yeah. themes or erotic themes? Yes, I have. In fact, I have one poem called One Night Stand. Oh. <laughs> it's about just that, about two people in a hotel room. And the, the twist that I put on it is that it's, uh, it's in a disabled hotel room and one of the, one of the people involved is, is in a wheelchair. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I mean, it, 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 just out of curiosity, do you have that with you? No, I, well, I could, possibly, I could possibly bring it up on Word if you give me a little while. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Hold on. All right. Um, Has this been one of your uh, well-received poems? Uh, it's, it's a fairly recent one. I haven't published it yet. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I've got it now. All right. Do you want me to read it? Sure. Uh, okay. It's called One Night Stand. I undress you like an onion, layerly and slowly lest I weep. Later, your skin shines in the reflected glory of the sunset. We curl trustingly into the dark, the fog like veils of morning. We unravel in the light of day, our only trace, the cheap towels crumpled and confused on the wet room floor. Is, is that it? That's it. Okay, that's oh, that's that's pretty. Yeah, I I, I, I like that. Um, I the, the line that really struck me was um the the beginning one. Um, I undress you like an onion. <laughs> I, I I have never I, I've never heard undressed an onion in the same sentence before. That's really interesting. Like, what inspired you to come up with that? I can't remember to be on. I, I think it was the idea of just peeling down layer by layer. Oh. Like you know when you when you when you when you peel, cut an onion, you've got to peel off that top layer first. Yeah. So, and also the emotion of undressing somebody, you've got a great a great 
fondness for or a great lust for, you want to do it slowly so that it doesn't just overcome you and you cry like when you cut an onion. Mm. And may I ask if this uh, is based on a real life experience or just something that came from your imagination? No, it's just something that came from my imagination. Okay. Okay. Although I am disabled, so I, I do, when I'm in hotels, I do have uh, ones with wet, wet rooms, you know, the ones where the shower is just flush with the floor. Mm. Uh, may, may I ask what uh, type of disability you have? Yes, I have a genetic disability. It's a connective tissue disorder, and it means that all my joints dislocate very easily. Oh, I did not know this disability was possible. Um, well, I mean, you're very subtle about it, so, I mean, hopefully I'm not, like, uh, Crossing a line or anything like that, but I, I haven't no, I haven't noticed anything. I've written poetry about it. I, I, it'll it's been published in my book. There's one called the Sideshow, and the same one will be published in Caduceus, the Yale Medical Journal, this, this coming year. Oh, that's pretty nice. Um, well, it was a great pleasure um, having you. Um, I wish you the best of success on your uh, poetry, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, please uh, spread the word to any of your fellow poets who might like to be um, interviewed in this manner. Um, you know, we can uh, we can always. Uh, continue to do that pre-recording format with the uh, uh, those other folks if uh, need be. Um, I am on uh, this Sunday night at ten, so uh, you know if you would like to tune into the interview, that's great. I mean, I'll put it on around I would say eleven o'clock. Are you still in Connecticut uh, this Sunday? I am. Okay, okay. So uh, if it's not too late, I mean, um, it's I would say it's ninety point one FM WECS, um, okay. and the site to tune in online is uh, easternct.edu slash WECS. W-E-C-S. Okay. Yes. All right. And, uh, yeah, once again, a, a, a great pleasure. And, um, yeah, I, I wish you the best. Okay. Thank you very much, John. All right. You have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.